Welcome to tonight's educational webinar hosted by Life and Breath Foundation. My name is Saul Kachowskis, and we're thrilled to have you join us here tonight. Our focus for tonight's webinar is what it means to be engaged with your doctor. Uh, but before we introduce our speaker, let's take a moment to talk about Life and Breath Foundation and our mission. Uh, Life and Breath Foundation aims to support the sarcoidosis community by providing effective tools for tracking their journey, understanding medical issues, and enhancing their quality of life. We also strive to create a nurturing environment where those affected with sarcoidosis can share their experiences. Also, we work towards rising, raising awareness within the medical community to combat this chronic disease. As a volunteer-led organization, all the funds we receive through donations and sponsorships go directly to supporting patients with sarcoidosis. We offer several services to the community, including a monthly speaker series like tonight, the Life and Breath Scholar Program for Physician Residency Education, patient support from sarcoid experts, patient support through sponsorship and education, and the My Life and Breath Planner. For tonight's session, we've already received pre-submitted questions online. However, if you do have additional questions, just you know, feel free to submit them in the, put them in the Q&A section, and we'll do the best to get those answered. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Mark Lamus, a regular speaker here at Life and Breath. He is the Vice Chief of the Department of Medicine at GBMC, that's the Greater Baltimore Medical Center, and the Director of Complex Care at Gilchrist Greater Living Health Partners. His medical practice focuses on patients requiring coordination between primary care, specialists, and other healthcare services to better manage several chronic, severe, pre-existing conditions. Uh, we do have a disclaimer. Please be aware that this webinar will not give medical advice. There's no doctor-patient relationship that's established here by talking with Dr. Lamus during our meeting. Our speaker does not know your medical background and cannot therefore give you any specific medical advice. Speak with your own physician before acting on any of the information you hear this evening. And with that being said, uh, Dr. Lamus, welcome. We look forward to hearing your information tonight. Well, thank you so very much. I, I look forward to speaking to you. This is a subject that's dear to my heart because the types of people that I take care of are, are really chronically sick. They are the people that have numerous active chronic medical conditions, have had five or more hospitalizations, had multiple ER visits, many times have five or six specialists, and they require coordination and discipline to be able to provide them care. So what I'm, what I'm gonna try to give you is some hints and ways to be able to improve your ability to communicate with not just your primary care physician, but to carry that thought process through. Because quite honestly, it's rare that a person who has a, a case of sarcoid has nothing wrong with them other than just sarcoid. And I hope to give you hints that will give you an opportunity to get better, better care. What is engagement? Engagement is a kind of a funny way to say, how do you get to both be on the same page so that when you're talking about your care, you're a participant rather than just saying, doctor, help me, I don't know what it is. So if you ask yourself, how does that work the best? Well, much of it is educating yourself. Another part of it that's fundamental is to be able to bring the information to you because not everyone is able to work in a system that has all the specialists working within the same medical record system or electronic medical record. And only with rare occurrences have I been able to find patients whose physicians all work together in a truly collaborative manner where they get together and literally on either a Zoom or a, a meeting face-to-face, -face, review an individual patient's care to make sure that everyone is aware at each step. So, or, or what's happened. So let's start out by saying, 
what what do you want to know right from the beginning? You you got to ask you, the doctor if you're going there for care for sarcoid or any chronic disease, and ask them how comfortable they are taking care of the condition that's been found. Because quite honestly, many times I've had people come and they bring me a stack of charts and it's very clear that the information that I got from other people, that the other docs were not engaged because they really had no experience with taking care of sarcoid. And they continue to go see them because they, they feel that they're, they're primary or they've been integral. But quite honestly, you do yourself a favor by asking them, how comfortable are you in participating in the care of a sarcoid patient? The next thing is, know really your own health history, write it down. The planner that we offer in this uh, Dife and Breath Foundation is actually something that has grown out of almost 10 years worth of talking and working together. I used something like this years and years ago. And I don't know, just, in, just so that you're well aware, I've been with Life and Breath for almost 10 years now, maybe even a little longer. But this was an outgrowth of the, the things I used in my chronic care practice of people with life-threatening other diseases. So we would sit down and they would fill out the questionnaire. If you walk into the office and the guy has no information and he has to sit down and ask, you know, what operations have you had? What have you had done? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he has to go through that. The time that you spend together will be doing nothing other than data acquisition. And quite frankly, it's not satisfying for him. And I'm positive it's not satisfying for you as a patient. So you want to bring with you the assemblage of much of the information that you need for him to understand. If you put this together in a manner where your health history sits in the beginning of the, the, your book or your, the planner, and you've assembled it, and today's visit is your let's use sarcoid, since that's what we're talking about today. Let's say that you've seen your primary care physician and you've filled out this information for him, and you're now going off to see an ophthalmologist to make certain that your eyes don't have any involvement, and you wanna be sure that you're getting good ongoing care for your eyes. You, know, you wanna say, what are my goals of today's meeting with the physician? How am I going to get the most out of it so that we get there? You start out by saying, hi, my name is Mark Glamis. I've been diagnosed with sarcoid and I've told that, been told that I need to have my eyes reviewed for the potential of it causing me problems in the long term. Are you comfortable working with me to help me make sure that my eyes stay healthy? And then you wait for an answer from him. And if he's not able to frankly say that, you have to say, what is your reluctance? Do you, is it something that you've not seen before? And if he really is not comfortable with it, you want to say, well, do you have anyone that you know that is comfortable taking care of sarcoid eye disease? Should I have it after your review? Do you have access to specialists who know what they're doing? Well, it's going to open up a whole different type of discussion than just saying, I'm here to have my eyes checked, right? So you have your visit with the man. He looks at your eyes. He looks at your retina, your, and he assesses the muscles, et cetera. You get all finished with that. And he, he looks at you and says, well, you know, I've reviewed your eyes. I see no evidence of any inflammation of the, the pupil of your eyes. I've looked carefully for granulomas. I don't see anything. And then he tells you straight on, quite honestly, I've not had many patients with sarcoid, but at present I don't see X. I don't mm -hmm. see that being a problem because I do know what sarcoid looks like in an eye. And I would be able to help you get referrals to an appropriate person. Okay, the pretty good answer, right? I mean, we've got something to work with. So you say to him, you look and you say, look, I need to have 
regular follow-ups with this? Should I get a red eye? Now, just think what I just said. That's because of your knowledge to know that sarcoid, because you've studied maybe what we've given you in the Life and Breath Foundation to say that sometimes sarcoid can cause a red eye and a vision change and could even potentiate glaucoma and several other things because we have all of that available within the data that you have in this, this Life and Breath Foundation. And you know, you take that piece of information, you keep it there, you, you've, you're educated enough to say to him what it is that you're hoping and expectations from him. Okay, and you make an arrangements and say, okay, I plan to see you again in a year for an eye exam, because it, this is the kind of disease that you will be just as happy to hear that say your eyes look perfectly normal and we don't see anything because that's what you're shooting for. You're hoping that this doesn't occur. So you get finished with your visit, you go out and you sit in the car and you take a piece of paper or however you're keeping those records and you write today's date. I saw Dr. John Smith, ophthalmologist. He reviewed my eyes. He saw no problems. We did not have any scheduled testing done, anticipated going forward. And I have a visit scheduled for one year. So now you go over and you open up your planner and you're thinking ahead and you open it for 12 calendar months. And you look at some date in there and you have a to-do list at the beginning of this, call it November or something like that. Cause you're gonna ask him, do you, should I schedule it now or how far in advance do I need to schedule a visit? Now you're being proactive to be able to get it clearly defined as what his expectations are of you to set up your appointment. He says, well, I can't get people in immediately. It would be best if you contact me three months before. So you open up the calendar to three months before that visit is supposed to be. <laughs> and you write schedule visit with Dr. <clears throat> Ophthalmology. So when you get to the beginning of that month, you look at your to-do list and it says, need to follow, set up follow-up visit with ophthalmologist to review my eyes. Ding a ling a ling on the phone, or you look on your electronic medical record, you sing a note over to them and says, I need a visit scheduled in the month of December at, at, before my one year follow up for sarcoidosis. Okay, so you get something back, you go over to that date, and you write on the calendar and you put when it is, what it's for. Now, what I just taught you is to really be the best possible patient for him. But now all of a sudden your visits are of much higher quality because you're not beating around the bush, you're not this and that, et cetera. So now you go over to that visit, okay? You go over to that visit and before you go there, you're gonna write expectation of what you intend to get on this visit. You want your eyes examined with a slit lamp, you wanna be sure there's no granuloma, you wanna be sure that there's no evidence for any active eye disease. Really important, right? Does Now, he might tell you at this visit, I need you over the next three months to get visual fields, which is a, a test the ophthalmologist might want because he's gonna look to see if the retina is working properly. And we take that, that information, you schedule the visit, and you do exactly the same thing I just told you with that. How long does it take to set up a visit? When do we set it up? How do we make sure it's in place, et cetera? If you rely on the doctors to make all of this stuff happen all the time, it might work if you have a highly advanced, very disciplined system. But my bet is that the majority of people that I'm talking to tonight can't say that in all honesty. And I bet you they mutter with how much fooling around it takes to get appointments. Okay, you get the idea of that kind of flow. But then when you finish the visit, you might say, it was a good visit, I had my eyes checked. I've been told that I need to follow up and get a specialized eye exam to make sure that my eyes are okay. So that visit, you put that right in place and you do it as on an annual basis, you know that this was ophthalmology, et cetera. Now, 
if you've got easy sarcoid to take care of, you might have only a couple of things to check on a periodic basis. But if you have advanced sarcoid that might require a cardiologist, might require a pulmonary physician, an eye exam, you might even have a kidney doctor thrown in for good measure, and you might have had two surgeries that have been followed by the specific surgeon who's been doing your work. You say, this is a hell of a lot of work to keep everything in place and do it this discipline. But this is the difference between getting superior superlative care from something that is frankly mediocre. Because now when you go to your visits, you take this book with you. And the first thing you remind the physicians with, since I saw you last, I saw the cardiologist, I saw the kidney doctor, I saw the blah, 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 blah. And you might ask him, is there any information that you don't have that might be of benefit to you that I got from these people? Now, if you're lucky enough and you could, they all work in the same system, all of this stuff would be available to him with the laboratory system. But if the system is not highly evolved, he may not even have been aware with it. Now, here's another hint. When you saw that ophthalmologist, you want to have said to him, kindly said a copy of your visit, okay, copy of your visit to each of the people in my care team. So he can open it up. He can click a, a single button if the, you are lucky enough to have Epic. This is a simple thing to do, but you have to remind him to do it because it's not the way most people get their care. If you have one of these other systems, you might have to go a little bit in a different way, but frankly, it can be done in Cerner. It can be done in any one of the ones that I'm aware of that are real EMRs that larger systems use. Okay, so what did I just teach you? I've told you there's an educational component that you need to spend some time to make sure that you're well informed about the disease. You wanna know what your own stage of the disease is. So, and you want from your primary, you want him to help you put together the essential database. And you'll see that in life and breath, we've set up a lot of that to make it easier. What is the minimum database that a person with sarcoid with a, you know, or maybe it's not even been diagnosed yet, but maybe a disease that has not yet been clarified, you wanna have so that you can bring it. So when you go to your visits, you're carrying this information with you. And if a doctor says, well, have you ever had an echocardiogram from your cardiologist? Oh, yes, I have. And you open up your book and you see cardiology and it says, oh yes, I had it on June 13th. Do you have that result? No, but I know exactly how to get it for you. Do you have a system that can look into the records of the other people on my care team? What I'm teaching you to do is how to prod the man to use the system to the fullest. That's what you need. Okay, now I hope I've been relatively clear with this kind of thinking that this works for any long-term chronic illness. You could use that same thinking process for diabetes. You could use it for chronic renal failure. You could use it for ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. These are, these are all, what I, I don't mean this to be demeaning, but these are real diseases where the need to have medical people really communicate well to make sure that everyone is aware of every change. You use exactly the same logic. So I hope I've given you a, the idea of a tool that you can use to take care of any of the diseases that you might be confronted with. And that book that you have of all the dates and times and where you did it, it's invaluable. If you go on a trip, and I saw a lady that I saw from, I think I saw from Australia, God help her if she leaves there. You, you guys used to have a book that you guys kept your medical records in. That was the way it was done. And that book you carried with you when you went to physicians, and that was the idea of a record that you carried from one physician to another. I wish I would tell you that I was smart enough 
to have invented some of what I've told you, but I stole a lot of it from you people in Australia because I was lucky enough to travel there and learn something from some of the physicians who did much of the same kind of thinking. Engage yourself. You have a, for yourself, don't be led, be a participant. Engage the physician so that you're both looking together at your data to take care of you. Please don't accept the idea of just being told what to do. You won't get the quality of care that you need. I'm, I'm here to answer any other questions and I'll be glad to go over anything. And if I wasn't clear with what I've been telling you, please ask, send Saul a, a note and I'll do my best to be clearer. I hope that this answers some of your question about what the word engagement means. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lamus. Let me, uh, we do have some questions. Uh, I'll start with, uh, there's two questions that I think are the same or very similar. Uh, it says, do you have a recommendation on how we can approach a specialist that dismisses many of our symptoms? And on the same vein, how can you engage with a physician who doesn't believe you, thinks it's psychosomatic? Well, I'm not going to be trite about this, but that's not the person you want taking care of you. If it, when people say things are psychosomatic, it either means that he hasn't listened hard enough or he hasn't been able to identify and can communicate to you well enough the reasons why he doesn't think that your symptoms are directly related to the problem you have. That's a very careless behavior. And I think I've heard that many times from other people. Uh, this disease can be literally diagnosed in some people by having a, a psychiatric illness. That just means he doesn't know enough about sarcoid because neurosarcoid can have literally psychiatric symptoms associated with the disease. If he doesn't keep an open mind to be able to, can, to go through all that stuff, you're not being thought of correctly. If you can't convince someone, I, I have to say it, you, if you go by the approach that I just went over with you, if you bring the data and you bring this stuff over and over and you've communicated it in the way I said, I think rarely are you going to have anyone give you a lot of flack because you've shown yourself to be educated about the disease. You're, you have brought data to be able to help him do his job. You're asking how to best interpret the data and you're asking for his specific help, help on your disease. You do need to have a primary that has some idea of what he's doing with this disease. Many times, if the younger people may not have even seen a single case, it took a long time before I saw a couple hundred people to the point where I felt like I had a pretty good grasp of what to expect. And it, it's not a simple disease for people to work through. I hope I answered that for you. Thank you, Dr. Lamus. Uh, let me, uh, this is very interesting. I live in New Zealand, I'm in mm. Auckland. There are five cases of, of cardiac sarcoidosis. Should I travel overseas for a second opinion? Hmm. Well, it's, it's a tough thing. You are, if you've already been diagnosed with cardiac sarcoid, you're one of far less than the one percenters in terms of sarcoid because the majority of people have really benign disease for at least 50%. Another 30% get treated with prednisone, they get better over time. And then there's a small fraction of people that have to be treated more aggressively. I, I don't remember specifically people in New Zealand, but the people that would have some level of comfort with this disease are frequently the transplant surgeons that are participants. The, um, 
you, I'm sure there are cardiologists. It, Auckland is a sophisticated city with sophisticated medical care. I think you would start in your town by asking for a pulmonary person because most of the sarcoid clinics that I've seen elsewhere in the world have been built around the pulmonary symptoms rather than thinking about it as a holistic disease that affects multiple organ systems in some people. I would, I would Google the idea of sarcoid clinic. And if I couldn't find something that popped up, I would ask the folks uh, for a pulmonary consultant. And I would ask the question, do we have someone in our regional area that has experience? Five people out of a town as big as Auckland says that there are probably more out there and they haven't found them all because it's more frequent than that. That's number one. To specifically answer your question about going elsewhere, we have some centers in the United States that have experience in Toto, but the places that might be the best options if you chose to make such a trip would be places like Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, not in Florida. It might be NYU in New York City. These are, these are two places that I know have extensive experience with cardiac sarcoidosis. And the, the other thing about it is you want, this would be an example of what I'd be asking you to put together before you made such a trip. How was the diagnosis made? Was it done by a bypass, by a biopsy? Was it done because there was an imaging test that showed in a patient with sarcoid an inflammatory response in the heart muscle? Without tissue, most people are gonna have a little trouble trying to tell you what the best approach is. The majority of folks, if you don't yet have any evidence of fibroid, fibroidosis, which means a stiffening of the heart muscle because of fibers being made by inflammation are treated with anti-inflammatory medicines. And there are multiple medicines that are being tested and they are available worldwide because the protocols for sarcoidosis are a worldwide protocol. And uh, if you look, we have a, on our website, we have centers of excellence in the United States. And I'm willing, if you give Saul your name, I'll look to see if I can find something for you to see if there are any in Australia that I can find. None come to my mind right this minute. I hope that answers your question. I'm not trying to tell you to get in an airplane and fly because I think you've got a lot of homework to do before you make that trip because you're going to get there. And the first thing the guy's going to say is, what about this, 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 and this? Do you have it? Blah, 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 blah. And you get to Cleveland Clinic, and all of a sudden, you'd spend the next 15 days doing tests to get the data that he, you might have already had done in New Zealand. Or I'm ready for the next one. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lemus. OK, next question. Uh, do you have more tips on how to communicate in ways that help doctors come alongside me instead of feeling challenged by my questions? Yeah, yeah. One of the hints that I teach people in the office, instead of me looking across the table from them and the doctor staring at a computer that, I, that they can't see, is you want to look at that. Some, would you mind if I take a look at the computer with you about my record? because it is your record, never forget that. That, that chart, it, the data in it is yours. Now, if he's threatened by that or something happens, you gotta work a little differently. But you might be blunt enough, you know, and it depends how your relationship is with the person. You might look at it and say, you know what? I really need to feel like you and I are working together to take care of my disease. Notice we are working together to take care of my disease. And I'm going to need to understand more about it so that as I go forward, I don't beat you up on the telephone with 96,000 questions that I probably should have asked you while I'm here. You'll soften the person's heart up. You'll get where you go, but 
use your communication skills, use the things that you are, you've been trained to do to get people to work with you. They can be tough. I, I, I know it's not always easy. Thank you, Dr. Lamas. Yeah, uh, you're next, welcome. Go next ahead. question is, is there really something that can control this disease? I have it in my bones. Well, control it means stopping it, control it. Well, we don't have, since we don't have the clearest understanding what sets it off and why we have it, since we're not certain that we know anything out of to do except to reduce the number of inflammatory markers that the PERT does disease makes. The, ease, the answer I'm sorry to say is I don't have any knowledge of any drug that uniformly stops the disease from progressing. But there are many diseases that you can go into remission, but that does not in any way promise you that in one year, three years, five years, 10 years, you might not have a relapse because that kind of thing does happen. We have great biologic agents. If you were listening to me three or four years ago, I didn't have access to the biologic agents. The biologic agents are an enormous help. These are drugs that were used principally at the beginning for things like rheumatoid arthritis or things that were used for ulcerative colitis. We're now developing absolute drugs that are specific to treat what are end up being identified inflammatory markers in sarcoid. But just realize if you know one person sarcoid, you know one person sarcoid. It's not that you have one drug like penicillin that would kill all of this organism. We don't have one that uniformly works like that. But we have great drugs. They're much better, good gracious. You can live out a, a high quality life without a lot of misery if you, if you work through it. There is a small number of people that the disease progresses and it's a real challenge. But even those people can live out virtually a normal lifespan, but they're gonna have aggravations. But with good care, you know, you're gonna to get to see your grandchildren and your kids and you know, all the things that are important to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, sort of uh, with one of the earlier things you were talking about, can you tell if you have heart sarcoid from an EKG? Well, there are some things that are pathognomonic. They're, they're called heart blocks. If you get a, a granuloma, which is the marker for the disease that attacks part of the conducting system. Yes, I have had people present with their sarcoid as complete heart block. And then when I did their chest x-ray, I saw an infiltrate and lo and behold, it took me a, a little bit of time, but I ended up figuring out it's sarcoid and it was sarcoid that caused the heart block that I picked up on the EKG. It can be, but it's a non-specific finding. You gotta go through the rest of the steps. An EKG alone is not enough to make it sarcoid. You gotta make sure you get all the rest of the data. Look at life and breath. There's an enormous, the data that's right up at the beginning of the educational series about teaching you about the things you have to assemble can tell you a whole lot more about those things. Thank you, Dr. Lemus. Next question, I've been recently diagnosed with sarcoidosis. How should this be monitored? Okay, now this again is steps right at the beginning. You, you need to answer for yourself. Do we know whether, how it was diagnosed? The majority of people sarcoid is found by someone getting a chest X-ray for usually some unassociated reason, they might get a pre-op to get a hernia fixed or something else. And they see a shadow that ends up being an abnormality. And through the evaluation of it, they go through the steps and 
you know, you, you get all the scares. Somebody tells you it could be cancer, it could be this, or it could be TB, or somebody biopsied it, and lo and behold, it comes back sarcoid. That's the most common way that sarcoid is diagnosed. But remember, sarcoid can be presenting as a red lesion on your skin. It can be a red eye. It can be kidney failure or an abnormal urine analysis that has a bunch of blood cell or red cells in it. It can be so many other ways. It can be a broken bone, thinking about the person you asked me earlier about bone disease. It can be because a bone fractures or the bones in your spine collapse and you get back pain. I mean, you can, any organ in the body can conceivably have a sarcoid lesion. That's why somebody has to be somewhat comfortable understanding about how to work through this disease. <clears throat> but to answer your question simply, you said, how do you know what to follow up? You're gonna go, you're going to at least annually, gonna be followed up as though you'd all the other things that are necessary. If you're the under the age of 50, you're gonna have a bunch of things that need to be done. Over the age of 50, you have other things to be done. As you get older, 75 plus, you have other things that need to be done. So you've got all those health maintenance items that are not sarcoid related. Some of the things that you're gonna be monitoring on your exam, which depends on the severity of your illness and the organs involved, are going to We'll be looking at kidney function, liver function, urinary sediment. You're going to get, if you have it in the eyes, you're going to need your annualized eye exam with an ophthalmologist, not an optometrist, because he's going to be checking to see whether you have inflammatory process in your uh, retina and on your, and your, we're tested for glaucoma. It may or may not be possible to get that kind of stuff done from an optometrist. It depends on the community norms for you. But once you know what is involved, then you sit down and you develop a care plan with your primary or the person in the sarcoid clinic or the person that you believe is the one who has to assume the responsibility for taking care of your sarcoid. And so you set up this care plan and from that care plan, you're setting up your follow-up visits when you get complete blood counts, when you get tests for each of the different things that are involved. It ends up being quite a bit of effort, but this is that, that thing we talked about when we first get started. How do you engage? How do you get the best care? I'm just telling you how much effort it takes to do it properly. If I wasn't clear, what I'm going to ask you to do is drop another note and you tell me what I wasn't clear enough about. Because early stage sarcoid is frightening because you don't know what the disease is going to act like in any one individual. 50% of the cases go away with no prednisone, no treatment, no nothing. You do absolutely nothing for the person. You get a couple chest x-ray and lo and behold, the disease melts away. And you go, well, what happened? What am I supposed to do? First of all, you say with great thanks to the eternal organizer of our world and universe, thank you, my disease doesn't seem to be really aggressive or active. That's number one. And then you look and say, okay, now that it's seemingly not active, I'm gonna follow it up and do it with some regular follow-up to make sure I catch it before I get a lot of other organ involvement if it were to relapse. Okay. Next one. Okay. Next question. Yeah. It feels really scary to just look for a doctor when there are so few specialists in my area. What do you recommend when I am so limited in doctors and I have one I don't like? That's horrible. That's a really bad situation. You know, I would be, there's very few places in our country that you're more than about 70 miles away from a major center that either has a medical school or has a large system. I don't know exactly where you live, but it might take effort to find either a university uh, medical system where they have a medical school. 
that frequently ends up being something. There are people that travel, you know, of several hours to come to people, you know, in our area to get people who are comfortable taking care of the disease. Some of that is just simply so that they know that, that, that they have some confidence that the person is telling them properly. If you have to, if you don't like the physician that you're taking care of, ask yourself first, what is it that you don't like about it? Because you're going when you go looking for another one, you want to see what it is. You want to try to be looking for traits that are not like this guy, you know, or, or woman. I mean, it could be anything. You want somebody willing to help you keep the bookkeeping in order if it's a primary that you're looking for. If it's your sarcoid doctor, the guy you don't like, you got to find a different one because this the relationship isn't going to end in a week or two. You know, it's going to be around for a while. You'd want to find someone that is you're at least comfortable asking the questions with. I don't know if I answered that, but you don't want to be working with somebody with this disease or someone you don't like or hasn't gone through the effort to do the things that you need. Okay, thank you. Next, next question. Uh, this is a really good question. How can you coordinate care between specialists? Remember I told you that if you're lucky enough to live within a system that uses the same electronic medical record, you look at the man and say, I want you to send a copy of your note to each person on my care team. That's number one. Number two, do you ever organize a conference call between the people on, in my care? Now, you don't need that if your disease is benign. If it's a very limited disease without a whole lot of complication, if you don't have cardiac sarcoid or in your liver granulomas and renal failure, you want to, you don't need to have six physicians participating unless those organ systems are all involved and under treatment. But the electronic medical record is the best tool that I have been able to see. It's revolutionized the way care has been provided to the people I take care of. Before it was downright difficult because you had to make copies frequently. I'm the one who sent, I'd ask patients before we had electronics, you know, I'd ask them to get copies of each of their tests when they were done, put them in my book. Um, I would send them to the appropriate specialist. I would make sure that every visit I told them what was done by the other doctors in the period between the time I saw that doctor last and the next person. I mean, kind of doing what the computer does normally. Um, you, you need to find a team that's integrated. The sarcoid clinics idea is meant to take care of that communication difficulty. That's why it might be worthwhile taking the several hour drive to find a medical system that actually has a bona fide sarcoid clinic, because that's how care is provided in the most modern, accurate way. That's how I, you could also be possibly involved in any drug trials if they were necessary. You know, a lot of the people in the sarcoid clinics have available to them treatments that are outside of the normal scheme. And many times it doesn't cost any money to do them. The, the drug companies are begging to get people with sarcoid that they would, after being fully informed what's going on, to be trials, of, to get trials of these newer medications. Really important. I hope I answered it. Yeah. Yeah, let me get another. This is a, I mean, they're all good questions tonight. Um, next question is how do I go to NYU? from Rochester, how can I go to that hospital system? I guess that has multiple. Yeah, NYU is a great place. Do you have, a, if the person has, if you have a pulmonary doctor or someone who's been providing you care, you, you would ask him, do you know someone at the sarcoidosis clinic at NYU? That's the easy way. And he may say yes or no. If not, NYU, if you call the general number, 
you ask for uh, the information for the sarcoid clinic or you Google NYU sarcoid clinic, okay? It will likely pop up. And if it doesn't, you go to NYU pulmonary clinic because there will be someone in the pulmonary clinic that's part of the sarcoid clinic. And then you say, can I please make an appointment with you? You set it up, you do the same things I said. And you come with that, that mm -hmm. book I told you about how to assemble. Don't come there with no records. You'll drive yourself crazy and you'll drive the doc crazy. Come with the records in your hands or the sign in for the electronic medical record that you use that the man could use if necessary while you're there to look at your record together with you. Many of us are, are more than willing to do it that way. If you come and, you, and I get somebody who's from Mississippi and they're at some hospital system that I never heard of, but they use Epic, I go, ah, okay. They give me the information. Do I have your permission to look at your record? And I have them sign a piece of paper that says yes. And she opens it up on the computer and we go click. And I sit there for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes and I review the record. Best way conceivable. Rochester, I, we, I'm remembering in my mind, we, we helped one person in Rochester that also used the people in Cleveland Clinic. I'm forgetting his name and we can't say it on this webinar, but there's also an excellent place. I'm not sure if the drive time is a whole lot different to NYU or as it is to Cleveland Clinic. And don't say the name. I just saw something pop up. I know who the guy is. <laughs> no, 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 he'll get us in trouble. The long and short of it is Cleveland Clinic has a really good one too. So you might choose between those two people. You're lucky you have people within not a totally ridiculous drive time to be able to get good care. I hope I answered it well. Yeah. <laughs> so I have two questions I think you can answer uh, one, with one answer. I'm gonna to try to relate them. It says, how do you convey concerns without anxiety that causes the physician to be dismissive. And the second question, which again has some similarity, do doctors want me to ask about them and establish a personal connection? Would that help, the, would that help me in the process? Don't expect to make him your friend. That, let me remind people of that. If he wants to make the overture to get more personal with someone, that's something, let him do that. But what you, when you have a, an honest um, communication of your concerns, you, you say to him, you know, I'm really scared with sarcoid. I've tried to learn all I can about it. My anxiety over the disease is high. I want you to realize that some of what I might be saying is because I don't feel I don't feel like I've got it under control. Usually that's enough to disarm someone. If they're being dismissive and they're just being not right, I was about to say something else. But if they're not if they're not right, you got to find somebody that you can communicate better. Some of what a doctor has to do is lift the anxiety from someone and to say I understand your disease. I've been taking care of it for a while. I'll help you work, walk the road of your disease for you with you so that you can get the best care you can. That's how, that's what you want him to say. And that's, you can use all the guile and use all your communication skills. That's how you get it taken care of. Um, next question is, why is fatigue a common symptom? And what suggestions do you have to help ease the impact to quality of life? Okay, the first thing if in studies that were done in looking at sarcoid patients, if it was active disease that was requiring prednisone or other drugs, okay, it's because at least in part, it's the inflammatory portion of the disease. Because remember, it is an inflammatory disease in many. Depression walks 
in, in the people with sarcoid, at least 50% of the people have depression listed on their problem list within a year of having the diagnosis in someone who has active disease who has required prednisone or biologic agents and otherwise. Frequently, you're going to need help from a behavioral health person because you got to you got to work through the disease. You know, there's that whole stage of why me? Why did I get this? What was it that happened? Are you sure about that? I have what you're telling me. I, I'm scared to death of the medicines you you want to give me. I don't know enough about them. How do I learn enough about them? You're going to have to help me walk through it. I don't want I don't want to come back three years from now and find out I've grown a another nose on the top of my forehead or something has happened to me. How do you know these medicines are safe? You need him to be able to communicate, him or her, communicate all that stuff to you. You have to have confidence in the man or woman. You have to know that he has an idea of what he's doing, you know, and that he's, he's done it before. You don't want to be the first one along the path, you know. Dr. Lemus, can you revisit one question? Just this, the second part, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess you answered it somewhat, but how do you deal with a doctor who is dismissive, is not believing you? I leave him. I, he's not the right person for the, he, I mean, he, you can't change basic behaviors in some people. If, if dismissive, what I think that means to me is, well, I just don't think you have that symptom or or that's just not important or it's all in your head. If that's the type of approach this person is taking with you, he's not satisfying your whole body need to be taken care of. This is a disease that is not like a cold or a sore throat or you stub your toe. This is a disease you gotta feel comfortable frequently for years or tens of years. He's not the right person. If he's going to act like that, there's you got to try to find someone that you're going to attend, be appropriate together with. Because that's not right. No person should leave and think that that's the way it is. Nobody should put okay. up with that. That's just really unfortunate, you know. Did I answer it? That was blunt. It I, think, not... I, th I, think, I, th I think we're good. Um, good. Unless we have some other questions, I think we're coming up to the hour. So I think we're gonna end just a little early. Oh, one more question. Let me see if we can get this one other. Oh, just a comment. Uh, that some, it happened with me and my neurology team just stood up for me and said, we know she has systemic sarcoid, sarcoidosis by test. So it was more of a well, comment. Well, the neurologist himself, in his wisdom, was able to determine that. Well, it's not that simple. Um, a neurologist talking about sarcoid, if you have neuropsych, you better have done all the rest of the stuff to make sure that the other organ systems are not involved. Or if so, what are they? Which ones are involved? He might be able to say with confidence that you have neurosarcoidosis by having an inflammatory imaging test, a pulmonary infiltrate that's proven to be sarcoid, a spinal tap that was done that showed that there was no TB or any other foolishness or other things that cause brain inflammation or the rest. It, it, it's not something that you make a diagnose flippantly with. you got to it's a little work. Neurosy neurosarcoidosis is not a, oh, just a diagnosis that comes blinkedly like that and say, oh, you have neurosy. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. It's never worked that way. And I've seen many, many, many of them. It takes a little effort to, to say with confidence what's going on. Okay. I think you answered the question. Oh, we got, I think he was coming up. Um, okay, they're mostly just comments coming in. So I think we're coming up against uh, the hour. We have a couple minutes we can give back 
unless anybody has some additional questions. I guess I'd like to thank, express our gratitude, Dr. Lamus, for delivering this wonderful presentation. And we thank all of you for attending, participating. Uh, remember, we provide these webinars on a monthly basis. So just check the website, uh, lifeandbreath.org for upcoming talks, events. Uh, and don't, don't forget to uh, look at the My Life and Breath Planner so you can go prepare to your next doctor's visit. Uh, so anything else, Dr. Lamus? No, it was, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to participate. Thank you very much. Until we meet again, everyone, remember you're never alone. Good night and stay safe. Good night.